American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello and welcome to American Catholic History. If you like our podcast, help others find it by sharing the episode and giving us a five-star rating wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Noel Heaster Crow, And I'm Tom Crow. Today we're talking about St. Damien of Molokai, the Belgian priest who gave his life in service of the lepers of Hawaii. This guy was incredible. Lots of people have heard of him. Lots of people know he worked with lepers in Hawaii. Maybe lots of people know that there's a really unique statue of him in the U.S. Capitol. But I'll bet that not a lot of people know details of his life or have really thought about what he sacrificed. He's regarded as a martyr of charity because he gave his life for the love of God's people. He willingly went to a place where death was very likely because he knew that the people who were forced to live there needed the gospel. We talked about another martyr of charity in episode 48. That was Father Benjamin Petit, who accompanied the Potawatomi along their trail of death. Both he and Father Damien clearly spent their time here on earth living for the other side, as the hillbilly Thomist would say. That really is a great album. It really is. If you can't tell, we're huge hillbilly Thomist fans. Yeah. But we're talking about Father Damien and the life he lived on this side. Like we said, he was another amazing Belgian Catholic immigrant, joining the ranks of Charles Nierinx, Pierre de Schmet, Charles John Sagers, Sutbert Mollinger, and Adele Brees. Right. So in the mid to late 1800s, the Belgians really did some incredible work building up the church in this country. We've done episodes on all but Nierinx so far. You can find them if you go to AmericanCatholicHistory.org and go to the Belgian category under episodes. But again, back to Father Damien. He was born Joseph de Wooster in Tremelou, Belgium in 1840. He was the youngest of seven children to his middle-class farmer parents who were devout Catholics and raised all of their children carefully in the faith. Joseph was a pious and conscientious child and showed an early desire for austerity. His older brother, Auguste, tells a story about how Joseph would hide a board under his bed during the day, and at bedtime he would quietly pull it out and put it on his bed to sleep on it. This was only discovered by accident when he failed to put it away early enough and his mother found it. So Joseph had a streak of self-denial from early on, and it seems to have run in the family at least a bit. Two of Joseph's sisters eventually became nuns, and his brother August, who was two years his senior, eventually entered the Congregation of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary, taking the name Pamphilio. Joseph, however, was destined by their father to take over the family farm business, so he was sent to school specifically for the lessons he would need to operate the farm. But God had a different plan. When he was 18, a mission given by some redemptorists at the college where he was studying captivated his heart. A schoolmate reported that upon coming home from the mission, he was changed. He would stay up very late, praying earnestly to God. Ultimately, he determined to enter religious life himself. His father didn't warm to the idea immediately. No, he actually wrote a rather striking letter to his parents to ask them for their permission. In it, he first gives all assurances that this decision was the fruit of much prayer, and it was clearly God's will for his life. Then he makes clear that he would not pursue this path without his parents' permission. But he reminds them, almost warns them, that it would be a great evil to stand in the way of God's will, and it would incur punishment. So they should consider carefully whether they would give permission. It's a great letter in its earnestness and how it shows both love and respect for his parents. But it leaves no doubt that Joseph knew what God's will was and just wanted his parents to come around to it also. Which they did. So yeah, at 18 years old, he entered the same order as his brother, the Congregation of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary, based in Louvain, Belgium. He took the name Damien and began the novitiate. There was some concern that his earlier education in business matters would be insufficient as a foundation for priestly studies, though no one doubted his devotion. He was seen as an earnest peasant hard at work in his own way for God. But that own way of his included a keen mind and an absolute dedication to pursuing God's will. So with some help from his older brother, he showed their superiors that he was capable of the necessary studies. His novitiate and priestly studies took him to Paris and then back to Louvain. Once back in Louvain, he was noted spending many hours praying before an image of St. Francis Xavier, the great missionary to the East. He was praying to be sent on mission to the ends of the earth. 
1864, his prayers were answered. His brother, now Father Pamphile, had also been praying to go on mission, and he was selected to go on mission to the Sandwich Islands, what we know today as the Hawaiian Islands. These islands were an independent kingdom at this point. In 1825, Pope Leo XII had given the Congregation of the Sacred Hearts the mission of evangelizing the Hawaiian Islands, and missionaries from the congregation had been there since. Both Pamphile and Damien were praying to be sent there. Pamphile was thrilled to be selected and had everything set. Set. But just as the date of his departure was nearing, he was struck with typhus fever and couldn't go. Damien, who was not yet ordained, went to his brother's bedside and asked Pemphile if he would give Damien permission to request to go in his place. The arrangements had been made and passage booked, so someone might as well go. Pemphile agreed enthusiastically. So Damien wrote to the superior general of the order who consented. Damien and Pemphile were both overjoyed when the news came. Damien set off for his home to say farewell to his parents and siblings. He would never see them again. And so, at 24 years old in 1864, he set sail for Oahu. Upon arrival, he completed his studies and was ordained a priest in the spring of 1864 in what is now the Cathedral Basilica of Our Lady of Peace in Honolulu on the island of Oahu. In 1865, he was stationed in Kohala on the island of Hawaii itself, that is, the Big Island. His efforts for his new flock were legendary. He traveled all over and never considered a community too far off to visit. In one story, he literally crawled over three large mountains of cooled lava, which were all craggy and sharp, to get to a Christian enclave that had been without a priest since their pastor died a while before. He was cut and bloodied, but that didn't matter. He worked hard to convert the natives from their pagan religions, as well as to overcome the false teachings of the Protestant missionaries who had been active on those islands for so many decades. He built many chapels and baptized or received many converts. Another challenge that Father Damien had to contend with, well, all of the inhabitants of the island had to contend with, really, was illness. The native population had no natural immunities to many diseases that came to their shores from places like China, the American mainland, Europe, and other Pacific islands. One disease that arrived in the 1830s or 40s was leprosy. Leprosy is a bacterial infection which attacks the skin and causes nerve damage. This can mean not feeling severe pain, like when you break a limb or have a severe burn, or simple pain, like when you get a cut. If the brain isn't alerted that something is wrong, then the person doesn't know that they need to fix something. Then small things we'd normally just take care of could get infected and turn into something much worse. Flesh begins to rot from infection and ulcers open up. Leprosy also causes paralysis as nerves that control motion get damaged. Also, the body begins to break down cartilage, which will cause fingers and toes to shorten or even fall off, and the nose to become disfigured. And all of this happens slowly over years. We're doing this graphic description of leprosy because we in the West don't have to face its reality. We hear about leprosy as this thing from history or third world countries, but we really have no real idea what a debilitating long-term disease like this really looks and smells like. It's a terrible and foul way to suffer and die. Fortunately, it's not as contagious as once thought. We now know that it is contracted through fluids from the upper respiratory system. But for centuries, it was thought that leprosy was contracted through simple contact. For many centuries, lepers were cast out from society and had to keep their distance. Getting leprosy was a long-term sentence to banishment and death. This was what the Kingdom of Hawaii was facing in the early 19th century. So to stop the spread of leprosy, the kingdom passed a law in 1865 that set up sequestration of anyone suspected of having leprosy. The sequestration colony was established on the Kalaupapa Peninsula of Molokai. This peninsula juts north into the Pacific Ocean from Molokai, and it is cut off from the rest of the island by a very steep, very high cliff. There is no wandering into the rest of Molokai from Kalaupapa. This law and its enforcement was horribly painful for those infected with the disease, as well as for their loved ones. There were mothers and fathers, children, siblings, and beloved friends who had to be forcibly removed to a remote place never to be seen again. Many people hid their relations and friends who had leprosy so they wouldn't be sent away. But the police found many of them and shipped them off to Kaluapapa. The government wasn't intending this to be punishment as though these people were criminals. 
The plan was to provide for the people there all of the things necessary to live, housing, food, some sort of public order, etc. But as with most benevolent plans of the government, that didn't happen as it should have. Society on the peninsula didn't develop well, and many of the people sent there began to lose their sense of humanity. Lewd and lawless behavior became the norm, which concerned the authorities, both secular and sacred. Bishop Louis Magre, who was vicar apostolic of the Hawaiian Islands, knew that the people marooned in Kalaupapa needed the sacraments and the gospel, but naturally, sending any priest there under obedience would be a very tough thing. It would essentially mean ordering a priest to his slow and painful death. Instead, he asked for volunteers. He got four, and 33-year-old Father Damien was among them. Father Damien had seen this terrible disease ravage his own population and take so many of his parishioners away, so he felt the pain of this scourge among his flock. The plan was that the four would go one at a time, and they would switch every few months so no one would have to bear that burden for too long. Father Damien was the first to go, arriving on May 10th, 1873. Bishop Maigre accompanied him on that journey, and when they arrived, he said to the lepers who came to receive them, So far, my children, you have been left alone and uncared for, but you shall be so no longer. Behold, I have brought you one who will be a father to you, and who loves you so much, that for your welfare and for the sake of your immortal souls, he does not hesitate to become one of you, to live and die with you. And he was 33, the same age Christ was traditionally, when he gave his life on the cross. You wonder if Bishop McGray knew that even if the other three volunteers were to come, Father Damien was going to remain. The decision about whether he'd ever leave the peninsula almost wasn't theirs to make after he arrived. Just two months later, the kingdom's board of health decided that he couldn't come back to the mainland or have any contact with anyone, period. But neither he nor Bishop Maigre knew this until one trip the bishop made to hear his confession. Just as the steamer that the bishop was on was drawing near, the captain informed the bishop that he could not leave the ship, nor could Father Damien come on board. So Father had to come out on a rowboat near enough to the steamer, but not too close. And then as the bishop leaned over the railing, Father Damien had to shout his confession to him. Fortunately, they were the only French speakers around, so they had a bit of privacy. But one imagines that even if everyone around them spoke the same language, Father Damien would not have allowed some embarrassment to prevent him from making a good confession. Uh, no, not someone who had gone all Maximilian Colby and volunteered to go to a place where the only way out was painful death. I think Maximilian Colby actually went all Father Damien. Okay, true. Bishop McGray and others protested this restriction, and it was eventually relaxed for Father Damien. He was given the same dispensation as medical personnel. But his time in Kalaupapa was incredibly blessed for him and for the lepers whom he served. He did find many of them descending into despair and despondency with all of the immoral conduct those can inspire. He brought with him the sacraments, the love of God, his incredible work ethic, and dedication to their well-being and salvation. He found only one chapel already standing, which was named in honor of St. Philomena, and he built more chapels. He built shelters, and he helped with health care. He dressed their ulcers, bound up their wounds. He went to them, loved them, cared for them, and showed them that God had not forgotten them. He also went to work advocating for better provisions from the government, protesting that it wasn't just to force these people to live in this place and then not provide ample building supplies for shelters, ample infrastructure to have clean water, and ample food on which to live. His efforts yielded good results from both the government and from private investment. People of every Christian persuasion were stepping up to contribute. Such was his notoriety and effectiveness. He reported that there was about one death each day. Of course, he offered mass daily, frequently funeral masses, and he helped to dig graves and to build coffins. But his was a joyous ministry. He was baptizing and receiving hundreds of souls into the church. He heard countless confessions, administered the last rites, sometimes noting that he wasn't sure how to do it because the person's hands and feet, which are anointed during the rites, were just stumps of fetid, ulcerous flesh. But in this place of misery and death, he was snatching souls from the diabolical jaws of despair and bringing them to Christ. A visitor in 1884 wrote of Father Damien, His cassock was worn and faded, his hair tumbled like a schoolboy's, his hands stained and hardened by toil. But the glow of health was in his face, the buoyancy of youth in his manner, while his ringing laugh, his ready sympathy, and his inspiring magnetism told of one who, in any sphere, might do a noble work, and 
who in that which he has chosen is doing the noblest of all works. This was Father Damien. Such was his life for the first 11 years on Kalopapa, during which time he reported no sign that he'd contracted the disease himself. And then one day he went to bathe, and he noticed that the water he stuck his foot into was scalding his foot and causing it to blister. But he felt no pain. By this he knew he had contracted the dreaded disease. This was in 1884. One interesting note, and it has to do with a common story concerning Father Damien. I'd heard long ago that the way he announced that he had contracted leprosy was by one day saying, we lepers, in his preaching rather than talking about lepers as you all. So he made it public by including himself amongst their number. But according to his own letters, which his brother, Father Pamphil, collected and edited, Father Damien referred to we lepers from early on in his ministry. It wasn't a change. He did it as a way to make clear that while some people are afflicted with leprosy physically, all are spiritual lepers in some way or other. It was one way he established a connection with the lepers and helped them see that they were not especially abandoned by God. But now he was himself a leper physically. He always knew it would come, and he almost embraced it as a gift. One thing it did was cause him to increase his activity. Basically, it seems that since he knew he now had a limited time to accomplish everything he'd set for himself, he had to just get it all done. But soon, he wouldn't have to do it all himself. He'd had assistant priests off and on through the years, but nothing permanent. This changed in his final years when four volunteer helpers came and brought reinforcements. Mother Marianne Cope, who was herself canonized, and we'll be talking about her in a later episode. Joseph Dutton, a very interesting character, a Civil War veteran who went to Molokai basically to find himself again. Another Belgian missionary priest named Louis Lambert Conrardi, and a nurse named James Sinnott, a layman from Chicago. Father Damien worked himself quite literally to death, as he didn't stop building and improving and blessing and offering Mass until he literally couldn't stand any longer. That day came in late March 1889. His death vigil was more than two weeks, but during that time he received visitors with joy, spoke of the symptoms of coming death, which he observed in himself, he'd seen them enough times in others, and waxed joyously about going home to heaven. Death finally did come on April 15, 1889. He'd been working in Kalaupapa for 16 years, and he was 49 years old. After his funeral mass the next day, he was laid to rest near the chapel of St. Philomena, near the spot where he had first come ashore 16 years earlier. After his death, some who were jealous of his good work tried to sully his name by suggesting that he had contracted the disease due to carelessness, that he was guilty of immoral behavior, and that the good credited to him was really the work of government agencies and other private efforts. One Presbyterian minister wrote an infamous letter suggesting some of these things, and it was published by the recipient without his permission in the San Francisco Chronicle. In response, the Scottish writer Robert Louis Stevenson, who was not Catholic, investigated the life of Father Damien himself. Stevenson had traveled to Hawaii for his own health after being diagnosed with tuberculosis. He spoke with many residents of Kalaupapa and others with firsthand knowledge of Father Damien, including many non-Catholics. He wrote a rather strong response to the original letter, largely putting those unjust criticisms to bed. In June of 1936, the King of Belgium prevailed upon the U.S. government to allow the body of Father Damien to be exhumed and brought back to Belgium, where he was interred in the chapel of his congregation in Louvain. But upon his beatification in 1995, his right hand was brought back to Hawaii and interred in his original grave. Which brings it all full circle in a way. He prayed in front of St. Francis Xavier's image to be sent on mission, and he was. So now, just as St. Francis Xavier's right hand is venerated in the Jesu in Rome, his right hand is venerated in Hawaii. When Hawaii became the 50th state in 1959, they selected Father Damien as one of the two individuals whose likenesses would represent the state in the U.S. capital. The other is Kamehameha I, the first king of the Hawaiian Islands. The big, boxy statue of Father Damien shows him afflicted with leprosy, his face scarred, and his right arm in a sling, with his right hand a bit gnarled, holding a cane. It is perhaps the most interesting of the statues in the capital. But the most important honor for Father Damien took place on October 11, 2009, when Pope Benedict XVI declared him Saint Damien of Molokai. You've been listening to American Catholic History on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, 
Please help others find it by sharing this episode and giving us a five-star rating and a good review. We also ask you to support the many productions of SQPN at sqpn.com slash give. To learn more about St. Damien of Molokai, to find previous episodes, or to learn about our upcoming pilgrimages to important and unforgettable Catholic holy sites, please visit AmericanCatholicHistory.org. We also love feedback and hearing about great Catholic history sites and stories from all over. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash American Catholic History, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, or follow StarQuest on Twitter at SQPN. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History on StarQuest. <laughs>